So I give myself situated here. Um, not really sure if people can see me. Hello out there in Zoom land, TV land, whatever land you want to call it. <laughs> Hello to everyone in the room, Jaquia Mark. So thank you so much for having me. And I don't want to say that you saved the best for last for this seminar presentation. I don't know what we want to say. It's a presentation. It, I mean, it's going to, I'm kind of because doing this more as a conversation. So this is kind of what I've been working on for the past however many months here on my research grant. And the title of this, and I guess the project has definitely changed from when I initially came here. I'm calling this project right now, a disconnected dias for question mark, emerging scholarly conversations on anti-blackness here in Poland. This is all my information and thank you so much for that wonderful reading. And yes, apparently I am very much so overly credentialed. So I have to find a way to streamline my thing because I, I have too much, like we didn't have to, <laughs> it's, it's too much, <laughs> but I appreciate all the, the, the acknowledgement things like that. And speaking of acknowledgements, you have to bear with me after you go through this. I have to make a couple of acknowledgements, of course. Thanking my advisor here, Agnieszka Konkańska. She is my advisor here through the Institute of Ethnology and Cultural Anthropology here at the University of Warsaw. I have an advisor, Dr. Monica Bobako. She's with the Center for Frontier Questions at Adam Miskiewicz University in Poznan. I have to thank the Polish U.S. Fulbright Commission. Um, yeah, they apparently thought my idea was good enough to come here. So I ended up being here and then, you know, thinking about it now, it's like, are they sure they want to be for my idea and all the things that I'm about to say? I mean, here we go. <laughs> but I also have to thank the University of Connecticut, the Department of Africana Studies, specifically the Africana Studies Institute. And I also have to thank my department, Department of Sociology, they were able to find some funds for me. So yes. So as I start this project and I start this presentation, I want everyone just to keep in mind, this is very much so a work in progress. I've been here for however many months. I'm still trying to figure out things. There's so many things and ways to contextualize what I've been doing here, what I've been observing here, what I've been trying to analyze here. So just be mindful, just give you a little bit of grace as we talk about these issues because it's still an emerging conversation. So yes, definitely a work in progress. So when I came here, I started with a set of kind of six research questions. Some of them kind of blend in together. Some of them kind of are their own thing. Like they, they're very, yeah, I, like when I was first formulating things with Agnieszka when I first got here, I had to, you know, expand a little bit of my conversation. So the first one is how is, and a lot of these things are going to be in quotations because these formations and definitions and constructions are a little bit not, I don't want to say problematic ways of formulating things, but it's definitely something where I'm still working it out and then scholarly work is still having its questions on what these terms actually mean. So first question is how is blackness and black defined in Poland in relation to the African diaspora and continent. I'll get more into that later, but my focus is specifically on African diaspora here in Poland, the conversations going on within African diaspora here in Poland. So yes, currently conversations going on in relation to Blackness and anti-Black racism in Poland. What are the gaps? Is there even really a scholarly conversation going on at this moment? What were the say previous scholarly conversations? Where does Blackness and Europeanness intersect in the Polish context and do they intersect at all? And there's going to be later on when I go into this, I guess my theoretical construction and context when I'm talking about a racial consciousness continuum, this idea of Blackness, Europeanness and Polishness, I'll explain more in a little bit. But yes, this idea of things intersecting, this of course this is an intersectional project because there's so many things at play here, but We'll get more to that a little bit later. Yes, next question. How does the Polish context of anti-Blackness broaden scholarly conversations, broaden scholarly sociological conversations, let me put that in there, more broadly on the subject, 
black how is anti-black racism systematized in the Polish context? Because yes, racism, ism means there's a system, means there's a structure, means there's a power play with somebody, let's say at the top, making decisions for folks at the bottom, and then you know, there's actual, let's say, structures and processes that you know facilitate racism and anti-blackness here in Poland as well. So you so we'll be getting into some of that. And then this last question. How does anti-black racism affect black refugee populations in Poland? Trying to figure out the issues and contextualizations of black Ukrainians here. I will get more into that as we go into this, because yes, there's been some interesting developments with that and some things where definitely had to make what I call scholarly pivots. And I've been pivoting a lot since I've been here. So if you know anything about the scholarly pivot, that's literally my life that has been here. So. We'll move on from that portion. So yes, how it started, how this whole project started, how I thought about, you know, having this conversation and, you know, formulating this research. So the original plan and the original theoretical framing that I came in here with, of course, and you have to forgive me with me coming from the American Academy, using American sources, using American sociological sources, and the one that I think still has some salience to what I'm looking at. It's this concept of the, well, it's the theory of racial ignorance. This comes from Jennifer C. Mueller. Just a couple of quotes here, give you a chance to read them quickly. Because the last one that I have here is like this idea. And I guess when I first got here, and like, I guess my, let's say, pre conference pre discussion before actually getting here and living here and having my own lived experience here this idea of not necessarily not necessarily saying the polish people don't know that people of color exist here specifically the african diaspora exists here because if you live in let's say your bigger cities like your warsaw your Polish nines your you know Wuj, Karabice, Krakow, like your more population centers like you've seen black people before but there's still kind of this thing where in the United States and the mythos is still like, there's nobody here of color. Like there's like no, not necessarily, like not even an African, like there's just no, it's all white. And historically, I mean, I'll touch upon some of these things here. Historically, that's completely and totally not the case. But when we talk about these issues of, you know, racial ignorance, it's not like people are just oblivious to things it's like, they know, like it's like they've seen it, but they're taking more of an active stance to be, let's say, ignorant to certain things or not willing to learn things. That that's a frame that I came in here with. It has shifted, but it still has some salience here when we talk about how people and like, especially when we have current conversations and Nisha just wrote a book, and it's interesting, like the conversations that were listed from when she wrote her book earlier back in, that came out in October, I want to say October 2020, like when I first got here, it's like, hey. yeah, so like these, so like these conversations, I mean, there's, they're here, but you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting of how it's being interpreted, so I'll go into that a little bit later, but yeah, this is how I started with the theoretical framing, and then the methodology, 40 plus semi-structured interviews. And the initial, let's say, populations of folks that I was looking at, Afro-Poles, and when I say Afro-Poles, I'm talking about people that were born here in Poland. Usually it involves a mixed race child, as in one parent is Polish, one parent is African. Um, but I use kind of the term Afro-Poles, like if you're of African diaspora, born in Poland, because You'll see when I go into some of the interview data that I have already that these there are folks here that say both parents are African and you know they have been born here, they know the language, things like that. So I use that term Afro basically saying if you're of African diaspora born in Poland. And then this one where I'm saying black immigrants post-1991, so basically after communism, but as this project has developed and I've been able to communicate with other folks, I have been able to find people who have been here since, let's say, 1970 something. And their perspectives are so unbelievably interesting that I haven't had a chance really to put everything that they have from there in there, but I'll, I'll give you a little taste of what I've discovered so far because 
a lot of the information that I got from that individual makes really salient points on conversations and things like that. Like and Black Ukrainian refugees and this third population group, it's been some struggles trying to find folks to talk to because a lot of the people that I've been interviewing, let's say they know of somebody or have helped someone, but it's a lot of them just kind of not staying. So this is what the, the group of folks that I was initially trying to try and find an interview when I first got here and then with the other things, which I can never say phenomenological. Wait, did I say that right, actually? <laughs> phenomenological study, partially ethnographic, thick description, and participant observation. So this is how I was going to initially think and contextualize my project. So the initial things that, you know, when I was first getting here and, you know, still trying to, you know, find my footing here, I was just mostly networking to find individuals that would, you know, fit into my study. And then I definitely had to tweak and pivot within my population sample. And then the big thing, which Agnieszka will tell you about, <laughs> where I had an initial IRB approved and then trying to get an amendment to uh, IRB. So... If you don't know what IRB is, IRB is short for Institutional Review Board for University of Connecticut. And I had to do an amendment to the original project because yeah, my original project involved me just talking to people through let's say Zoom or whatever else. But you know, I'm here in Poland in person. I can actually talk to a person. But University of Connecticut was just like, oh, you have to make sure that you have this, this, and this. And then whenever I would submit something, I would have to submit a document. Yes, just bear with me as I go through this. I would have to submit a document with track changes, then a clean document, and then an explanation of a document saying what I did to it. So about three or four times, and my advisor getting involved back in the United States, and then supervisors getting involved. Eventually, the amendment got approved. So, but it's part of these research things and research processes, especially involving human subjects, especially coming from the United States Academy, where we have a long sort of history, you know, abusing communities of color within the United States. And then, so I, I understand the hoops, but like, come on now. <laughs> but like, like I said, like that was part of the issues of, you know, formulating this project and getting things squared away. And then right now, and, you know, even at that initial point, in the data collection stage, interviewing and still seeking people to interview, I have interviews. Still trying to find people to interview. So if you know anybody, please send them my way. Putting in a plug right there. And then rudimentary dating findings from the interviewer. Well, I have a little bit of data. I call it rudimentary, but like since this presentation and and you know the formulation of this presentation has been going on, there's been a lot of developments on things. So yes, still in a review of literature and other primary scholarly sources here to answer some of my research questions because yes, I have all these research questions in the world, but you know, I have to have a, I guess a literate, literal, well, like a literature understanding of what's going on here. And then once interviews are completed, coding will commence and a key for these codes will be established. So this is kind of where things, I'm, I'm kind of in a middle stage with this because these things here are done. These things are being done as we speak, but, um, there's a couple other things where we're going to get into more of the heart of, you know, from the little bit of data that I have right now, I've been able to formulate some opinions and thoughts and questions. Now, I introduced this portion here. These are some of my actual quotes and interview data. For, it's like I have a question on my interview protocol asking about, you know, the first time you felt, let's say, Black, felt African felt othered, this individual, and yes, for record purposes, everyone here has been anonymized or like I made them anonymous or like gave them pseudonyms. So the person here, I am naming him Musa. I, he was born in Morocco. And then when we have these conversations and I'll, I'll touch a little bit on this when I speak more about you know blackness versus Africanness, he's from Morocco. And yes, I fully acknowledge conversations on North African in relation to, let's say, rest of Africa, those conversations and tensions when we, you know, were speaking about what is African. I'll touch upon a little bit of that at a later point. 
but I just give you a chance to read this one because I found this very, very interesting, this first one, because yeah, your first, like this individual, he's been here how many years? Um, I'll go into some of the demographics for this first set of individuals in a few, but yeah, he's been here like not even how many seconds, and then it's like being profiled, essentially. And yeah, like the last sentence here, I'm just, yeah, in that moment, I understand, like, yeah, this is welcome to, welcome to Central Europe. It's like, oh, yeah, I, I kind of get it. <laughs> and then I'm going to move on to this next one. This is Amal. She is Afro-Polish, and I actually had a chance to interview her father, and I'll explain a little bit later, because yes, he, her father, um, from Nigeria, came here in the 1970s, but I had interviewed her first, and then she was like, yeah, my father would love to talk to you about this, so I eventually had a chance to interview her at a later point, but yeah, this first question, you know, on, you know, first time you felt Black, African, or other, give you a chance to read that. And then the M word, which um, for those that don't necessarily know and those that may be in the audience, um, the M word is basically the, I'll say and put it in quotations, version, which is equivalent to the N word to a lot of folks here. It is a very problematic term. There was, and my first, let's say, entry into looking at anti Blackness issues here in Poland as an aside was activism on Don't Call Me Version, where everything that happened with George Floyd back in May of 2020. There was, uh, let's say, country-specific movements around the world talking about police brutality, anti-Blackness, and one of these came up in the sense of talking about this word and how this word in the Polish language, for those that have been here for years, is offensive. And there was a whole YouTube series on that. And Funny thing about it is the YouTube series that, you know, got a lot of traction. I was able to interview one of the women in that series and get some of her perspectives. And you'll see a little bit of that later when I talk about the disconnected diaspora conversation. So, yes, a little bit of a foreshadowing, but yes. These first, let's say, instances and this next one. And yes, she was the very first interview that I did for the project. Because yes, you notice how a lot of these involve, especially the ones that are Afro-Polish or you know born here, they start very early. And it's this conversation which I don't want to call it, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, this idea of racialized trauma. I mean, you have let's say your childhood traumas, you know, like you know, because things happen as a child, but then you compound, you know, the racialized whole component of it as well. And I mean, I have my own lived experiences as a child. Because, yes, originally from the southern portion of the United States, where being called the N-word as a young kid with my grandpa going to a store, I'm like, I'm only 39 myself. So you got to think about it. that's not too far away in time of these things still going on in the United States. And then when you have the comparative conversation here, like a lot of these things and a lot of these issues coming up involve some kind of, let's say, racialized trauma, which is not the big focus of my project, but it's something where when you ask people their initial thoughts and feelings and instances of feeling, let's say black or something, it usually involves some kind of trauma. So for the first set of interviews that I did when I got here, is this idea of, and it's it basically kind of like a class-based argument as well, because for a lot of people who are Afro-Polish and their parents have come here, um, it's very much so the parents that were coming from Africa were coming here for education. So they're, let's say, going to medical school, going for some kind of, so like they have, let's say, that educational capital, then they have, let's say, that language capital. And then when you, for this first set of people that I interviewed and, you know, it's continued on where they lived in other countries besides Poland, employed in various careers, you know, that allow for, let's say, mobility. So they come from, let's say, some sort of level of privilege because their parents are both educated in most cases from the ones that I've interviewed and then have lived in Poland for longer than six months, can speak the language. So 
these ideas of multiple kinds of capital, you have your language capital and being able to know the language, speak the language, you have your cultural capital and like grown up here in Poland, you know, the, you know, was it the desert in the wilderness stories, and you know, unfortunately, the Bombo poem, if you know about that poem, like, they have all these references, and like, they, they, they have a legitimate claim to being Polish, and then, as in their Polish, but for the fact of how they look, and I do ask about skin color, but then my interviews as well, but based on, like, you know, the way that they look, and it's like they're automatically discounted, especially, and I have seen this so many times with the people that I have, you know, when I would go for interviews and things like that, and they would start speaking Polish. In the bigger cities, they're not too much, you know, concerned about it, but like, it's still kind of a surprising thing where, you know, when I talk to them, they're just like, yeah, when people look at me and I start speaking Polish, they're like, how do you know Polish so well? And it's just like, all of these things here and like most of them being born here so it's like they have every right to claim polishness but it's still constantly being questioned on like regular everyday interactions so one of the things that I've come up with this is kind of from the first set of interviews and it's continued on so how it's going <laughs> how it's going um the way that I've decided to split up this next section in conversation, I'll explain way more in the theoretical context because these are kind of things that I've been thinking about in the, let's say, ideas and, and you know, ways of, you know, I guess putting my scholarly stamp on conversations of anti-Blackness. I kind of want to go through these. I don't want to like brush these over, but I'll give you a chance to look through like, you know, why I'm talking about, you know, this historical and cultural context. Because you have to think with not just, you know, African diaspora here and African diaspora being racialized. You got to think about the other communities that are here that have been racialized historically. So the Jewish contextualization of racism and race, Roma, Romani, and then literature and the arts and their role in framing Blackness and Africanness. Like I said, I mentioned was, uh, yes, uh, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce this gentleman's name, Sienkiewicz, uh, Desert and Wilderness. Like, if you're Polish, I guess you know of that story. And then, you know, Mushinik Bombo, that poem, which both of these things are apparently still being taught in schools. And it's like, uh, why? <laughs> and then, you know, questions on Europeanness, questions on Polishness. And when I talk about like these questions of Europeanness and Polishness, there's very much so this nationalist too, because like I also ask in my interviews, you know, how do people feel about the political climate here? And I guess with the political climate here going on, it's little not the most hospitable to anybody <laughs> that is not like, let's say, Polish, but then this idea of Polishness and Europeanness and, you know, if you, let's say, watch the news or hear anything on the news where you always hear Poland being kind of the antagonist of the EU, but if you've been anywhere in Poznan or anywhere around here where like, especially in Poznan where the entire city is destroyed because they are taking that EU money. So it's like, you want to be part of the EU, you want the money, but you don't want the traffics of, let's say, what it means to be European. And then this conversation of Europeanness, which when we talk about Western Europe, we also have to talk about empire and coloniality. So coloniality, having its roots and basically being racist. So it's like, how do you have all of these questions here? And the theoretical co conversation we're gonna move into in a little bit, like these are the things that I've been thinking about, but we just have to get through this. So this conversation of like, what we not gonna do, what we can't do, maybe, because there is so much with this, because I'm still trying to figure it out. And this is the part where I say, very much so a work in progress because it would take me a lifetime to fully contextualize all of the experiences of marginalized communities here. We have to think about the conversations here, specifically in Poland, that even though it was not a colonial power, even though it wasn't involved in the slave trade, it wanted to be involved with the slave trade. So that conversation pulling it in and a lot of those, let's say, colonial pursuit conversations, how it informs conversations on you know, Islamophobia, racism, xenophobia, things like that, LGBT issues, all of these things. 
linkage between Jewish and Roma in American context on anti-Blackness. There's, there's a bit of a history there. There's been some writings on the linkage between Roma rights and civil rights, and I'm still trying to parse through that because in some cases, I can see the argument of Roma racialized as Black, and then when we're saying racialized as in Roma being racialized as the worst of the worst, and in the American context where you bring the conversation of what it means to be Black there, you have the African-American conversation where folks from, let's say, the West Indies or from the African continent now were just like, oh, I am this. I am Jamaican American. I'm not African American, but to anybody else, especially if you're in the city of Atlanta, city of Detroit, what hey, you know, Hartford, Connecticut, you black. So, like how you mold these conversations together. And like I said, it would take me a lifetime to get done with these issues. And then the other issues that you know have come up in this research, issues of gender, and then from the in people that I've interviewed thus far that have been willing to talk to me about racism issues, the majority of them have been women. So it's this idea of where are the men in this conversation or the men that I have talked to, some have agreed to be interviewed with me and I'm you know, getting those squared away. But the ones that you know, I have, let's say on the record have been the women. They're usually the first ones to be like, oh, I wanna to talk to you about this, 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 this. And I think there's something to be said about that how I'm going to talk about that, stay tuned. So yeah, and the other big thing, I guess, with you know, getting all these historical, cultural contexts, the amount of time and real estate that I would need for, because let's be honest, this information that I'm getting from here, like first and foremost thing has to be getting a dissertation done, but getting this dissertation done, but and effectively contextualizing everything that's going on here, it would take me a lifetime to do so. It's going to take me some time to figure this out. So like I said, again, I repeat, this is a work in progress. So now we get to kind of the, when I'm talking about theoretical context, this is the things that I've been thinking about from the interviews that I've been doing so far, from the reading that I've been doing so far, my ideas of like how to, let's say, come up with like a theory or way of, looking at issues of anti-Blackness here. So this first concept that I am calling a racial, con racial consciousness continuum. If you're aware of W.B.E.B. Du Bois's concept of double consciousness where you deal with and how let's say African-Americans deal with the pressure of being Black but also being American and like how those identities are shaping and informing their lives. And this is back in the 1900s. So move this forward a little bit having conversations with Agnieszka and Monica about this idea of triple consciousness of, you know, what it means to be, let's say, Black or African here in Poland, being Polish and then European. But I, and yes, this is very rudimentary. Like, I'm still trying to figure out this connection because I'm trying to make it seem in such a way that this is more cyclical. And for all intents and purposes, I know this is a very basic construction, theoretical construction. I'm still working on exactly how to think about this, but I'm calling this like a racial conscious continuum as a, this is a very tentative visualization. So you have this idea for some people who would fit, let's say, the phenotype of being, let's say, Afro-Polish, but maybe they don't recognize, let's say, the Black or African side. So they'll be, let's say, Polish above all things. And then European conversation may come into play as well. And those kind of like, you know, battle with one another. So before we get into the conversation, I could actually split this concept of Black and African because I'm gonna explain in a bit what I mean by like, say it's splitting up conversations of Black and African because there's a tension between being Black. I kind of introduced it a little bit earlier, this tension of being Black this tension of being African within the Polish context. So sometimes you have these all three intersecting, and I view this more as a hierarchical, but I'm right now in the phase of trying to visualize this and visualize this in such a way that it makes it more hierarchical because you can kind of, in some cases from the people that I've interviewed, from people I've just kind of talked to in you know preparation for getting interviews and just you know getting let's say a 
context of things here. These all kind of flow into one another. And I'm still trying to figure out exactly how to make all these concepts work. So please forgive the very rudimentary, basic <laughs> um, way of looking at this. So that's my first theorization of you know this racial consciousness continuing. Yes, still in process, still in working with that, and we'll, I'll be fleshing that out. Blackness versus Africanness. I took this from this, um, this first quote comes from Charles W. Mills in a edited volume called specifically Anti-Blackness. And then I'll just give you a chance to read that. And you can link that conversation with colonialism as well with what went on in the United States, you know, with slave trade, things like that. And then you have Blackness versus Africanness or Blackness and Africanness. Because if you look at um, Amal's, like when I had that first quote from Amal in the first section, where like her Nigerianness was, you know, kind of front and center, like her father said, I was like, you know, you are Nigerian. So, you know, you have that connection to the continent, but then, I did not put this in that quote up there, but when I asked, you know, she's, she's like, I feel black every day. So it's like you have both these things kind of either fighting with one another because what some from some of the people, and I'm going to be, you know, giving you a little bit more context in a bit about some of the other people that I've talked to, where being black is, let's say, more, I want to say it's more valued here or not. It, not like it's more value, but like having a connection more to the African continent can be more problematic than just saying that, oh, you're Black. And then I guess in my case where, and then I'll talk more about, you know, my own lived experience here. I mean, people can kind of tell that I'm American, but I definitely look Black. So it's like, how do you have these conversations? And I'm still trying to problematize Blackness versus Africanness here. Blackness and African is here, racial consciousness, I think can help explain this because, like I said, it's more of a continuous, more of a blending, it's more of an intersectional way of viewing lived, phenotypical, lived, everyday experiences here. So still a work in progress, still thinking about this. And then this last point, which, you know, supposedly the title of this presentation, A Disconnected Diaspora, and the individual, like I said, I introduced Amal to you earlier. This is her father. And when I was, you know, just having, you know, you know, just a little visit interview was like a good three, four hours. So it was absolutely great. And then the one thing that I took away from that quote where, oh, like, you know, from that interview is kind of a paraphrase, but it kind of forms everything when we talk about this conversation of the disconnected guys for. They don't feel like they're at home. In a way, he was talking mostly about, let's say, Afro-Polish children, because in a lot of cases, for whatever reason, the African parent had to leave. Either they were literally, you know, forced out of the town. It didn't work out with the parents, things like that. There was all different types of reasons where sometimes the parents, like the relationship could not work out. But I mean, it also plays the same with this next person that I talked to, I'm calling her daughter. Both of her parents were from Nigeria, but she's born in Gdansk. And then when we talk about this idea of, you know, not feeling at home, even though she's born here, born to African parents here, knows the language, went to school here, all of these things, she still has this commentary on being here. Because, like, you know, I bring up this conversation that I had with Fami earlier, this idea of, you know, not feeling that there's a connect to a community here. This, this idea of not, let's say, feeling at home. And then this next person I'm going to introduce you to, he's a student in Lublin, where, because, like, I have this also formulation of this concept of this connected diaspora where even though they don't feel like they're at home, but they also kind of know that there's other people that are here that look like them, but there's no really like organized connection. So this is talking about, I guess, sort of his work, like, you know, through his 
groups at and like what he knows through his university because there's all these different like you know telegram groups whatsapp groups where you just look at the countries there's just mentions of ethiopia he's from tanzania so you have tanzania rwanda and nigeria like you have all these different communities that are here and they know that they're here but what's the connection as in is there a connection just you know, just looking at somebody on the street and like the whole, you know, as another aside, since I've been here and, you know, been walking around more, this idea of the head nod where you see another Black person and it's kind of like you acknowledge each other's presence from being in a very white country. <laughs> so like, you know, these unspoken things like that unspoken connection of like, if you know, you know, and unfortunately, I mean, well, fortunately, white people, you, you don't know. But it's like, it, it's, it's that common, like, I see you in your blackness, see you in this country of whiteness, and we have a connection here. So like the, the you know, there's just those everyday interactions. But the thing that made it interesting for me looking at all this, and the thing that's come up with me, this idea of a forced community in the United States where, Historically, we had separate but equal, so we had to go to separate schools. Um, slavery was a thing, you know, in the United States. And then, you know, you had to live, let's say, your red mining, we want to talk about. So all these things were community, and especially Black community in the United States, was kind of forced to be together. And, you know, with slavery, like, you know, where it broke up families, new families had to be created. And then you look at what went on in the UK where, you know, colonialism, yeah, it was a thing. So I'm still thinking through this idea of a forced community and how it's compared to here in Poland, where in some cases it was kind of like it. the thing that brought people here was not, you know, slavery, you know, moving, you know, like it, there was more of an economic pull here. So the idea of blending one's communities together is interesting. It hasn't been really thought out that much. So I guess where this is going from here, I've talked a little about this, where even though a lot of these people that I've talked to, they've been here for a number of years, they can speak the language, um, you know, they're going to schools here. So let's say they got, you know, how many different pedigrees and credentials from universities here, constantly being challenged. Let's talk a little bit about this idea of trauma and racialized trauma. I'm still trying to work through that because I don't want to make this project, let's say, something about the oppression Olympics. That's something that comes up in a lot of these types of conversations. So I'm trying to figure out a way to speak about these initial actions, you know, these initial interactions and speak to that trauma, but not make it a trauma project. Also, this concept of, you know, working twice as hard to get half as much where I talked about earlier, where they know the language here, they, they're born here, went to school here, but they're constantly being challenged. And yes, kind of, so yeah, it, it's a lot. So conversation of Black when you have means and capital, and like I said, when people were coming here, most of the time they were coming here for education, so they had some kind of mental capital, you know, that type of educational capital to come here and just trying to figure out these conversations because there's definitely a class argument in here. More data collection needs to be done. I feel like this is a valid starting point of where I am right now to have conversations on the African diaspora and, you know, just basically say that, yeah, there's an African diaspora here. It's a dynamic diaspora. There's a lot of things going on here. And, you know, just, I'm still trying to, I'm at a, I think I'm at a good starting point, but stay tuned on whatever else. And then these two things with methodolo methodological approaches, I expanded it because basically I'm just trying to talk to anybody that's black here that's been here longer than six months. Because it's one thing, you know, like this project being more word of mouth thing and just trying to find folks, like you'll find people, but then do they want to talk to you? And then there's been a lot of people that I've talked to where they're like, since I guess the community that like looks at these issues more and you know wants to talk about more of these issues is a small community and they're tired. They're tired because literally it's like it's not like they're no they're the namesake for their race here in Poland, but it's like they're just 
they're being pulled in so many different ways. And it's like, this project, I'm not trying to do harm, but I'm, you know, I'm trying to bring a conversation and expand the conversation outside of this part of the world. So it's like, how do you blend these things and how do you get their stories out here with not, you know, doing harm? <laughs> because I mean, it's, it's a lot of work and I can speak to, you know, in a lot of cases in my own lived experience, being the one speck in a sea of white in a lot of different places in my life, education-wise, just life-wise in general. So like, I, I, I get it. And then bringing my own story into it, I've had not want to say like hostile, like, you know, hostile racial interactions. I've had racially awkward interactions and I need to find a way to tell about it. With this being a sociological project and bringing this back to the American Academy, they want an empirical case and they want the empirical case you know, to be, you know, to stand on its own. But if I don't bring my own story here, and I've been here almost a freaking year, if I don't have a way to tell my own story about this, like this would, I would be doing a huge disservice, not only to the people that I've been talking to here, a disservice to myself. So how I'm going to pull all this together, because remind you again, to be clear, <laughs> this is a work in progress. So with that being said, these are some of the references that I came up with. And then, yeah, I now will take your questions on what I've been doing so far. So that's pretty much my spiel on things. So I await your questions. Thank you very much, Brian. I will try to cover, right? I will just tell the people online. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to ask